For this lecture, we're going to learn a little bit more of detail about observational methods. Of course, this is highly relevant to the studies you guys are going to be carrying out in the next few weeks. The material can be found in Jackson's chapter 4, just a few pages in there, pages 81 to 86. And once again, it's going to be important to pay attention to the details and the way things are presented here in this lecture because it's a little bit different than the way that Jackson presents the material. The terms are used mostly the same way, but if anything, there's a little bit more specific way we use some of the terms than the way Jackson uses them in the textbook. The first thing is to classify different types of observational methods. And again, Jackson does this, but she uses terminology that varies somewhat. So to make sure that there's consistency, I want you guys to understand the three different types of observation that we're going to use here. And this is the way they're commonly referred to in most research methods textbooks, as well as in colloquial usage in psychological science. The first is what we call naturalistic observation. As it sounds, this is observing behaviors in their natural settings. Now the important part here is we're going to refer to naturalistic observation only if it occurs without awareness of those who you're observing, and without any manipulation or intervention. So, for example, when we looked at the examples in class on Thursday, when we were observing from the second floor, the 125 classroom door, to see how many people were holding the door open, that was an example of naturalistic observation, because we were completely removed from the situation, and the behavior was occurring completely naturally. Now, if we violate anything that's going to make it such that the behavior is not occurring naturally, and then what we may have is a situation that we would refer to here as participant observation. So what we're going to say is if the people are aware that you are recording them, in other words if, it, if it's happening such that they know through some sort of participation in the situation that you are indeed recording their behavior or that something is different than it otherwise would be, okay, or specifically if you're doing some sort of manipulation, then that is no longer going to be referred to as naturalistic observation. So in the second or third situation, I guess, on Thursday, when we were looking at those class videos, when we had the video camera right in front of the doorway, it's not natural to walk out of room 125 in the psych building and see a camera staring you in the face, or even if it's across the hall. So now something a little bit different has happened. Okay? There is some sort of awareness that the subjects were being recorded, and what we're going to see on the next slide is some problems that this can cause. That then is what we're going to be calling participant observation. Okay, now, even though it's not like the person standing behind a video camera was an active participant in the situation, okay, there was still the sense or the awareness of the participants that they were being recorded. Okay, in this situation, then, it's not what we're going to truly refer to as naturalistic observation. Okay, now, Jackson makes the distinction between disguised and undisguised and participant, all as different forms of naturalistic observation, but this stronger distinction is what's typically used in the literature and again in colloquial use when we talk about naturalistic versus participant observation techniques. Now some more common instances of participant observation are situations where exactly as it sounds the researcher or some part of the research team such as a confederate is actively involved in the situation. So a lot of your projects sound like they're going to involve participant observation where you guys are doing something or creating some type of situation where the confederate or one of your research team is actively involved in the situation or specifically changing something about the environment. Okay, these are going to be instances of participant observation. Finally, both of these which occur in the natural setting, in a field type of setting, can be contrasted with laboratory observation, which is exactly what it sounds like, observing behaviors in a controlled lab setting. Now again, this can happen with or without the participant's awareness, typically with, and with or without the researcher's involvement. Okay, now these are going to be situations where sometimes the, the participants, the research participants, are aware that their behavior is being recorded. And a lot of times you might think that if they're showing up in a lab, they're almost certainly aware that something is being recorded. Okay, but it could be in a situation, as we've seen some of the studies, where a research participant is in a waiting room. Now there, they're probably not aware that they're currently being recorded because they think they're just preparing to begin the study. And in fact, laboratory observation occurs most of the time with developmental research uh, that's aimed at children. Okay? And a lot of times what this involves is bringing children and their parents into a laboratory setting. Now again, the children, of course, are going to be aware that they're in a lab, but they may not be aware that on the other side of a um, you know, tinted glass or something that there's researchers, people who are observing their behavior. Okay? So in this situation, uh, it may or may not be uh, in, involve awareness, 
if the researcher is in fact then the one playing with the children, then it's also going to be uh, involve the researcher's participation as well. So laboratory research is really distinguished just from its setting within a controlled laboratory setting as opposed to out in the field. Now as you might be aware, and as again came up in class when we were talking about the situations on Thursday that were on our videotape, there's a number of issues that may or may not arise with different types of observation. And again, Jackson talks about some of these as well. The potential issues are all listed here on the left. Okay, we're going to go through them one by one. And when, then what we're going to do is identify which of the observational methods are most susceptible to the potential issues um, or are going to have the types of characteristics that are listed here on the left. Now, I want to stress here quickly that any of these different forms of observation could theoretically uh, fall prey to some of the issues listed here or contain the properties, the desirable properties, which are the last two, control and ecological validity, that you see here. But in terms of the way that I'm going to classify them now and here on this slide, this is uh, what the modal study is going to look like. In other words, uh, whether or not most of naturalistic observation studies fall prey to one of these issues or laboratory or whatever the case may be. Okay, so again, you're going to see some check marks showing up here that are going to classify these observational methods on these issues, but I don't want you guys to think that, for example, there isn't a single naturalistic observation study that falls prey to reactants, even though you don't see a check mark here. Reactants, what we talked about a little bit on Thursday, is where the participants in the research study change their behavior in some way due to the awareness that they are being observed or recorded. So they're reacting to the presence of the researcher or the confederate. Okay. Now again, this is going to be a little bit um, uh, different than you might think in terms of whether you're actively trying to involve some sort of reaction out of them in participant observation versus uh, what you may be doing in the laboratory. Now again, this isn't to say that no naturalistic observation study is going to fall prey to reactants just because there's no check mark here. But most of the time, if all you're literally doing is without their awareness and without your involvement or manipulation in the situation, you're just recording behaviors, then they, you shouldn't expect that the, the, the subjects of your recording or the people, the participants that you're recording, are going to react to this in response. Okay, so again, it is typically participant and laboratory situations that you may uh, see the most reactants, whether or not it's desirable reactants. And sometimes participant observation, reactants is exactly what you're looking for, is for participants to change their behavior. But if what you're doing is trying to, uh, you know, get into some kind of group, you want to study the behavior of some cult by joining the cult, okay, you don't want them to know that you're a researcher and to react in a way that is due strictly to the fact that you are observing them. Now the second type of, of situation to consider when you're doing an observational study is expectancy effects. Now this can lead to researcher bias. Now what this is, is if think about the situation. If you're the one recording the behavior, then you have a good idea of what things you're going to be looking for in terms of your hypotheses or what sorts of results you expect to find. Well, unfortunately, what this can do is lead to biases in the way you're recording the behavior based on those expectancies. Okay? And really, any type of observational study can fall prey to this. Now, we didn't collect the data to analyze this, um, and the, the data we did collect wasn't optimal for analyzing it, but on the activity we did in class on Thursday, what I tried to do is prime some of you with the hypothesis that the men would be holding the door open more, and others of you we tried to prime with the situation that the women would be holding the door open more. Well, in observational studies, a lot of times, as you guys noticed, it's not necessarily cut and dry whether or not you should be recording an instance of a behavior. Was that person really holding the door open for somebody else, or did it just look like it? Well, if you know the way your results are supposed to come out in terms of your hypotheses, what that can do is to lead you to, especially those questionable situations, record them in a manner that is going to benefit your hypothesis. So in other words, because you expect to see, for example, more females holding the door open, then if it's a questionable situation, you might give females the benefit of the doubt, but not the males. Okay, and again, this uh, can lead to a bias, a systematic bias, in the way that you're collecting the data. Now, this may happen consciously or, or, or subconsciously, if you will. It doesn't have to be a deliberate thing. You're trying to purposely skew the data. Okay, but knowing the way the results should come out, again, you might be a little bit more lenient measuring one thing one way and something else. Okay, if you're measuring kids on the playground, 
maybe if uh, one kid trips another kid and you think that uh, the kids that watched violent programming are going to act more aggressively, if you know for a fact that kid saw the violent programming, you might call that an intentional trip, whereas if it's a kid that was just reading, you might not be expecting this kid to exhibit these aggressive behaviors. And therefore, when you see the same tripping behavior, you might chalk it up to being an accident, for example. Okay, so again, expectancy effects are something you guys are going to also have to realize could become an issue in the projects you guys are doing and figure out ways to minimize those. And we can talk in class about some ways to minimize these effects as well. Now, logistic issues is really a very broad range of things that are going to come into play in the natural settings. We talked about these a little bit, uh, but you know, things even like time of day or weather or the, the types of things you're going to need to remember to involve um, even just bringing the appropriate materials and being ready for any sort of situation are things that are going to um, affect these field settings, naturalistic and participant observation, much more than a laboratory setting. Okay? And the same can also be said for other types of unexpected events that might occur. Okay? So you don't really know what sorts of things may be coming up. Okay? There may be, for example, a real distress situation when you guys are trying to stage one to witness helping behavior there might be some real situations that come up or some other things that happen in an unexpected way uh, that, that are going to occur that are, may obviously skew the way that your study goes. So again the main point here is that in a laboratory setting the benefit of doing observation in a lab is obviously the chances are going to be minimized if these sorts of unexpected events may occur. You may still have a fire drill or something like that even if we're doing a study in the psychology building but these types of unexpected events uh, and odd logistic issues coming up are much less likely to occur in the lab than in the field. What that also leads to is an enhanced measure of control that you have in the laboratory. Okay? Now most importantly what this is, means is that it's going to be a lot easier to attribute the behaviors that you're witnessing in the laboratory specifically to whatever manipulation you're doing or whatever characteristics are of the situation that you're creating. Okay, in the laboratory, because you have much tighter control over everything, including the weather and the lighting and the temperature and really every other factor, okay, because you don't have to deal with these unexpected events, it's a lot easier to say that the behaviors that you're witnessing, your dependent variables, are related to and in fact caused by the independent variables that are the interest of your study. Okay? Now in that sense it leads to much tighter, specifically what we're going to re refer to when we talk about experiments as internal validity, the link between the IVs and the DVs in your study and that tight control. Now you don't necessarily have that in the field settings. Okay? So you don't understand whether or not you might be trying to manipulate something like mood to see if that affects people's helping behavior. But because you don't know what happened to the people right before they received your mood manipulation, okay, because you don't have control over some of the other factors that are going on in that natural environment, it's a lot harder to make that, that link between the two behaviors and to establish that degree of internal validity. However, one situation where field settings excel relative to a laboratory setting is in another type of validity that Jackson does talk about called ecological validity. And this is exactly what it sounds like. Because you're observing the behaviors in their real setting, then it's more likely that you're talking about the type of natural or realistic behaviors uh, that are going to be involved. Okay? In other words, if you're trying to recreate some sort of setting in the laboratory, you can't really guarantee that the types of behaviors and the, the types of results that you find there are in fact going to generalize back to those real world settings. So even if you bring kids into the laboratory, and give some of them, say, some violent programming and other kids not. And then you uh, let them into some sort of controlled setting where you have a specific number of toys and you want to see whether they fight over them. Now, you don't necessarily know that those results that you find there are going to generalize back to those kids in their houses or in their schoolyard or anything else. Okay? So by having this tighter control over the situation, a lot of times what you're giving up in that sense is ecological validity. These things are, are typically pulling in opposite directions here. If you want to make something more realistic, you have to, in a sense, give up control over some of these factors necessarily. Okay. Now again, just because these check marks are thrown up here, this is uh, sort of a stylized representation of these different types of observation. Okay. There's no reason to say that any single one of these studies couldn't have um, or lack some of these issues.